to take you on a little journey because to get to where we're going, I need you to come with me to where I've already been. See, I'm a person whose faith is of utmost importance. It is core to who I am. I wasn't raised in the church, so I came to understand faith and have a relationship with Jesus as a teenager, a teenager who had endured a tremendous amount of childhood trauma. I won't go into detail about that right now because it's not the time or the place, but suffice it to say, I knew what trauma was. So you take a traumatized teenager and introduce her to a Jesus who is all about love and freedom and redemption and making all things new. I am the good shepherd and no one can snatch you out of my hand. Yes, please give me that. So I was all in. My faith became my rock my identity, the thing that helped me overcome and endure and find hope and purpose. And so I leaned in hard. To this day, if I take one of those spiritual gift assessments, faith is at the top of the list. I dedicated my entire life to it. So then a couple of years ago, a strange thing started happening. Reading God's word, felt poisonous to me instead of life-giving. I couldn't sing the words to even my favorite worship songs without breaking down. I'd sit in the parking lot and cry before I could compose myself enough to walk through the doors of the church, looking on the outside like everything was okay. I left my job every day, my job as a pastor, feeling like an absolute hypocrite. So what was happening? What was this horrible thing that could make a person who loves God so much, whose very identity is bound to their relationship with Jesus, what was this that was making me question my faith on every level? What was this thing that was slowly breaking and deeply wounding me so much that I just wanted out? This is church trauma. It's religious trauma. And if you're listening today knowing exactly what I'm talking about, because you've been there, I see you and I hear you and I love you and you are safe here. I'm gonna talk to you all in just a minute because we can't keep this a safe space for you without some empathy or at least some understanding on the communal level. So first, let me address all of you who have not experienced any kind of church trauma. Because if we're going to be better, if we're going to put an end to the hurt, we have to do a couple of things. First, we have to believe that it exists. We have to acknowledge our role in it. We have to commit to changing it. Okay, so first, yes, church trauma does exist. It's a real thing. You can Google it. And here's what you'll find out. Religious trauma is the result of experiences that occur in a religious community or church that expose the members to indoctrination messages, coercion, humiliation, shame, or abuse. Not things that should happen in a church. Or you'll find this. Religious trauma occurs when a person's religious experience is stressful, degrading, dangerous, abusive, or damaging. Again, not what we want from the church. And yet this is the experience for a surprising number of us. Because so many of you brought this up when we asked, 
what we should address in this series, I know that many of you right here have experienced it. Religious trauma is very real. It is not people with some kind of hateful vendetta against the church trying to make stuff up. In fact, it's usually quite the opposite. It's the church with a hateful vendetta against people. And that is exactly what I was witnessing. In the name of Jesus, in a place that touted love and should have meant it, that is what started to chip away at the faith that I held so dear. And I am just one story. And lest anyone discount this entire message as, well, that's just Becky's thing, I asked some of you for your stories because this experience is not just mine, it's not just my son's or my family's or my closest friends, it's yours. It's the real experience of the person sitting down the row from you, the person who held the door for you, the person who sings on our stage, the person who goes to your small group, the person who attends our youth group. It's the experience of someone who can't even bear it enough to walk through these doors to see whether or not we're gonna hurt them too. So I asked for the stories and I listened and I discovered some commonalities. One, the cause of the trauma is very seldom overt. You're not slapped in the face with it the second you walk through the door, it's subtle. It's small at first. It's things that we participate in and don't even realize the damage that they cause. Are you ready for it? It's gossip the need to know and share everybody's business. It's clickiness, overlooking people, leaving them out, the unspoken judgment and sideways glances. These don't seem like a big deal, right? Not so big as to cause trauma. Wait until you're the subject of it and then tell me it's not a big deal. Church, can I be very honest with you? I love this place. This place has been so redemptive for me. And so I love you enough to tell you this. These are actually things that I see pretty commonly, even around here. And it only takes a little bit and someone is wrecked and we are not the place that wrecks people. So can we commit to crushing these things, to have no part in the gossip, no part in the conversations about people without those people. No part in the judgment to be outward facing in our circles so that everyone has a place. Church, we have to be so mindful of these little things so that we can create a safe space for everyone. It's no coincidence that the space we gather in is called a sanctuary. A sanctuary, by definition, is a place of refuge and protection. Let that sink in for just a minute. There are a lot of our loved ones right here whose sanctuaries in the past have not been that. They've betrayed them in ways that were very big, in inflicting trauma that was, in fact, a direct attack, actually hurting people by weaponizing God or God's word, by not honoring the image of God in them, by not allowing them to have a voice or to use the gifts that God had given them, forcing them to fit into some kind of mold and breaking them in the process. I saw this happen in my own family and that hurt runs deep. And I am thankful for a place like this that has been a true sanctuary especially for our youth who can just come and be accepted as they are, fully included as they are, and hopefully break the cycle of trauma. I wish that we had discovered this sanctuary sooner. I wish that my son and anyone else for that matter would have never had to hear, God can't love you the way that you are. We don't talk about that. We love the sinner, but hate the sin. If I never hear that phrase again, it will be too soon. Love the sinner, hate the sin does not have a chapter and verse because it's not in the Bible. God never said that. 
People throw it around like it's God's word and it's theologically manipulative and it's wrong and it is trauma producing. So instead, what does have a chapter and verse? How about this? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Or how about this one from 1 John? There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Or how about, let's be real basic, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. Did you catch that word? Guess what it means? It means whosoever. When we try to corner the market on who God is or what God is doing or who God loves or who God can use to do the work of the kingdom through, and if that leaves anyone out, we are overlooking a whosoever, a whosoever that Jesus loves, by the way, and that is not okay with Jesus. The church should never be guilty of driving people away from Jesus. And we won't be if we commit to loving like Jesus, to including like Jesus, to setting people free to be who God made them like Jesus. We will be a true sanctuary, a place of refuge and protection. And that will be a beacon. And God will unleash something immeasurably more here than all we can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I am on board for that. But now, before I wrap this up, I promised I would talk to all of you right now who know firsthand what I'm talking about when I say church trauma. I wish that these words were magic. I wish that they could undo all of your hurt. They cannot. And for that, I'm sorry. But I do want to offer you some encouragement. From a person we meet in John chapter 4, which is a familiar story of the woman at the well. Jesus intentionally goes to Samaria, where Jews didn't go, and he ends up meeting a woman there, alone at the well in the heat of the day, not included in Jesus's religious circle, ostracized in her own religious circles, safe to say, a person with some trauma. And Jesus sits with her. Jesus has a conversation with her. Now, interesting fact, in the Gospel of John, she is the first person to whom Jesus even says, I am the Messiah. Jesus reveals that deep truth to an outcast, traumatized woman. And then here's what happens. The woman goes and tells everyone about it with these words. He told me everything I ever did. He saw me. And she brings the whole town out to meet Jesus. And now here's the thing that I never realized in this story until recently. The disciples, the guys who had been walking with Jesus, the guys with the ongoing one-on-one -on -one theology class, they had also just gone into that same town. The disciples brought back snacks. The woman brought back the town. The disciples go into town and they bring no one to Jesus. This woman brought everyone. And that is so important. My beautiful, brave, broken friends, you have a powerful story. You may have been told that you do not have a place in the kingdom of God or the work of God. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. Jesus knows everything about you. Jesus sees you and asks you to hide nothing. Your story is strong and compelling and life giving because your story can lead others to the person of Jesus. I pray that Jesus is who you meet here week after week, and that you find healing and redemption and beauty and purpose in your story. And I pray that this is a sanctuary for you and that as a community, we will continue to be the sanctuary, the place of refuge and protection 
for so many others who still need it.